there, I'm Jackie Ferris. This week on the 302, we're taking a deep dive into maritime history, not talking about lighthouses, but light ships. We're here at the light ship Overfalls, and we're gonna tell you everything about this vessel, from what it was like to be a member on board to what it takes to keep this vessel going. Get ready to hop on board. The 302 is sailing your way. like everybody on the East Coast is familiar with lighthouses, but what about light ships? We're joined now by Dave Beck, who is one of the guides here for the light ship Overfalls. Now, Dave, I got to tell you, a lot of folks don't really know what a light ship is, but it's basically a lighthouse was, at sea. It was a floating lighthouse. It, ha it was just like a lighthouse, except that they would put it in the water over shallow water areas where big shipping had to get around them without running aground. So each of these shoal areas where these were put uh, were, had names. And when, the, when these ships were put on each station, they called them, they gave them that name. And this ship actually uh, was on three different stations. One was a uh, cornfield point off of the, co the coast of Connecticut in Long Island Sound. It was there for 18 years and it was called the cornfield. And when it was moved uh, after 18 years, it went to another shoal area called Cross Rip. Uh, and uh, that was off the coast of uh, Martha's Vineyard. And it was given a new name, Cross Rip. Uh, it was only there for five years and then it moved to Boston where it finished out its career after 10 years as the Boston. It was retired in 1972 and brought here with all the names removed. Uh, and um, at that point, the closest station to here had been abandoned by ships in 1960. So we took that name, which happened to be Overfalls. Overfalls. Now, there are how many of these ships? There's only six of these left-ish. Oh, um, there's eight of them that you can actually visit. Uh, around around different parts of the country. There's mm -hmm. one in, uh, I can't name them all, but there's one in California, one in, in Oregon, one in the Great Lakes area, Port Huron, uh, one in, in Boston Harbor, one in New York Harbor, uh, one in Portsmouth, Virginia, which is, uh, was never a station, <laughs> but the, the city of Portsmouth got, the, got a hold of their ship like we got a hold of ours. It was given them by the Coast Guard. So when you're talking about the function that Lightship Overfalls performed, it wasn't just um, you know something that they go out to sea and they come back. They had to go to the shallow areas and stay there, and that was a hard life for the what 11 men that were on board. Yes, um, they were, they had to act like a, a land-based light uh, house. They had a. A, a light, they had a radio beacon, they had a foghorn, they had all the things that a lighthouse has, except that they were on the water, where they couldn't build a lighthouse. And uh, there were about 50 stations around the country, not just on the East Coast, but on the Gulf Coast, West Coast, and in the Great Lakes. And that could be a dangerous job to have. Could be very dangerous, uh, and it, uh, depending on the, on the luck of the draw, but uh, each, each of the guys on this ship were on for two weeks at a time. Um, there were two dangers they faced. One was weather, and the weather could be in the, war in the form of hurricanes, flowing ice, uh, just high winds. Um, the other danger was the possibility of collision, and there were at least 150 collisions between these boats and uh, the bigger ships that they were trying to protect, usually in foggy weather when they couldn't see each other. Uh, but the point being that storm, during storms, at least five of our light ships were sunk and, during, and at least five more were sunk by collisions. Now, one of the collisions was a collision of note, the sister ship of the Titanic, right? That's correct. That was the RMS Olympic. Uh, the Olympic was a sister ship to the Titanic. It was built within a year of the Titanic. At the same size, same tonnage, basically. If you saw a picture of these two ships side by side in Belfast where they were built, it'd be very difficult to tell them apart. 
But you know what happened to the Titanic on its maiden voyage? That was in 1912. But by 1934, the Olympic was still moving back and forth between Europe and New York. And it was in 1934 that it, the, the Olympic hit one of our Nantucket lightships. Uh, the Nantucket station just happened to be one of the most dangerous because it's out there in the North Atlantic. It could be anywhere from 50 to 80 miles out, depending on what the shoals were doing. And it, it, it had to put up with a lot of traffic. Every large ship coming into New York City from Europe had to go past the Nantucket light first. So they had lots of close calls over the years. In just 1934, they got a little too close and hit the, hit the Nantucket lightship and sank it with a loss of seven lives. Now you also talked about weather. I know that the main anchor, 7,000 pounds, the backup anchor. Was 3,000 pounds. And how big is this uh, ship? The ship? How much is, does it weigh? It's well. 412 tons in its underwear. That's not a, not, it's actually one of the smaller ones. The Nantucket ships were, could be 25 to 30 feet longer than this one and heavier. Uh, I, th I think the, the new Nantucket light ship they built uh, after the one was sunk uh, weighed something like 950 tons. So it was much bigger than this one. So when you're talking about weather, they have to stay put no matter what the weather. And in a hurricane, they're, the anchor is, they're tied. So there was a special thing that they would have to do in order to try to stay. Well, they're, they're hanging off the anchor. The, the anchor chain could be uh, several hundred feet long. Normally, in, when the storms came up, they would let more of that chain out just to give it a little more stability to the ship because as the waves would bring the ship up, that would, put, that would stress that chain. So uh, they had, if they made it longer, they had a little more play for the ship. Um, I'm lost now. <laughs> What's this question? Uh, a little bit longer for the ship. So yeah, basically well, all this was done to try to keep it from capsizing or well, breaking loose from the anchor. That's right. The more strain you put on that anchor chain, the, more, the bigger the possibility of losing the chain, uh, losing the anchor. And that, uh, that happened a lot on the Nantucket station. There are lots of uh, rogue anchors on the bottom there <laughs> that were lost during storms. Uh, the other thing that, the, that you could do on the ship was actually start the engine up, the main engine, and drive straight into the wind and try to take some of the tension off the chain that way. I can imagine that was probably pretty scary though, being in the middle of a storm and, you know, well, in this huge ship and well, feel like a buoy. It didn't feel like a huge ship when you were in a storm. It was, it was bouncing around like a cork because it has a relatively low draw on it, so it was just kind of floating on top. So it took the brunt of everything that hit it. And for the sailors who were inside it, it was not a fun thing. So you guys have records, you know, accounts from uh, the, some of the men that worked on the light ship overfalls and other light ships? Yes, uh, well, yeah, there are lots of stories that, that different sailors will tell you. I mean, there, like I said, there were uh, 50 ships operating at any one time on average. That it was sometimes a few more, sometimes a few less. But they all had different experiences depending on where they were, where they were, uh, anchored uh, so uh, yeah there, there are written records of this the Coast Guard now has some of those records uh, there I, I don't think they're anywhere near complete a lot of this stuff went unreported over the years but uh, there is a lot of information out there and a lot of information yet to learn Dave thank you so much we're gonna be right back with more on the lightship overfalls and this is Ken, and we're owners of the Odforium, and we want to start on you on the 302. Welcome back. We're talking to Lightship Overfalls curator and vice president Ray Glick. Now, Ray, we heard all about the lore behind the ship itself, but when you walk on the deck, this really is an amazing um, piece of, you know, seaworthy machinery. Yes, this ship was built by the Rice Brothers uh, shipyard. They built a lot of the minesweepers during World War II. They built several other of these vessels. In fact, when one was, while one was being built, the place caught on fire, and they had to rebuild it later on. But it was built in 1938. It's the last of the riveted light ships that was built. Now, if you'll notice, this is an all-riveted vessel. 
uh, throughout. It's diesel powered, uh, has a top speed of nine, uh, or nine knots uh, from, from a diesel engine, but normally uh, this ship is not underway. It's anchored full time, except when it goes into shore uh, for refit and so forth. One of the things that I thought was really cool was the rudder. There's, a, there's like a knob in the bottom of the deck. If something goes wrong with the rudder, if the cable breaks, there's, a, there's a, like a, a wrench yeah, that you put on the thing and you kind of steer a, the ship. It's a unique piece of equipment. Uh, it's a wrench that goes on top of it and they have to hook it up to the winch that's up above there with the, the, uh, the winch that's powered by compressed air. Um, I have to tell you just a quick story about that. Okay. Though. They did uh, deck tours uh, when they men, when new crewmen went on, and one of the sailors that I took on that actually served on the light ships, uh, I asked him, I said, I'm so glad you're here. I'd like to know more about this. What did you guys do? And he said, we were being toured by a warrant officer, and we asked him about this. And his comment was, gentlemen, before we use that, we're going to abandon ship. Oh. <laughs> so, so apparently it was something that, that they had that could be used uh, and I think Dave mentioned the day that they sometimes did drills with it, but they had to take time to set it up and to make it work and so forth. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the light itself. How far can you see that light? And the light on this ship is 57 feet above the uh, water, water level, uh, so therefore it could be picked up at 12 miles out. Uh, and it flashed every uh, th three seconds. And the horn? The horn uh, could be picked up at five miles out. It was only used uh, when visibility dropped below two, two miles uh, in the fog, uh, it could be picked up at five miles out. Very high decibel level, about 120 to 140. You and I have pain when it gets up around 90. So you can see it was something that the crew was pretty well told to stay off the deck when the foghorn was, was blowing. But even then, they must have had issues with hearing. Yes, they did. A lot of the light ship sailors, um, when they retired, they all have had hearing problems because of that. Uh, light, uh, hearing protection back then was certainly not anything close to what we have today. You know. mm -hmm. So that would be every 30 seconds? Every three seconds. Every? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Every 30 seconds, th th and it lasted for three seconds when it blew. So how do you sleep? If you're on this thing for either, two weeks. Either you get used to it or you don't sleep. It's one or, one or the other. Uh, and I, I think as we were touring earlier, we heard about the fact that some of the men got so used to it that when they stopped it, then they had trouble sleeping because they were so used to it. And then I think Tracy was talking about the fact that some of them learned to talk where they would, uh, every time it was blowing for that three seconds, they would not talk and then they would talk for 30 seconds yeah. and then stop again. So. Well, we're going to chat with Tracy in just a little yeah. bit, but I wanted to go below deck with you and talk a little bit about, you know, just what it was like living on this ship for these two weeks. I, it, it's interesting. When we have people come aboard, a lot of them say that they're spacier than they thought it would be. Um, it's fairly well spaced out. The bunks, a lot of people look at the bunks, but they are six foot long. Uh, the men's cabins are two to a cabin. They have lockers in there. They have a head, of course, uh, which is up by the main winch. That's, when you that's, say head, you mean bathroom? Yes. I'm okay. sorry. I'm talk, <laughs> talking. I, I give quizzes on. No, that's all right. I make people say what the two terms are in, sure. in terms of maritime terms, but the head, yes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the, then if you go aft, uh, you'll find the office quarters there. They had their own sinks in their room, uh, their cabins. Uh, they were not, it's interesting, the crew's rooms were called cabins. Uh, the officers' rooms were called staterooms. So not much difference except the officers were single bunked and they had, uh, they had a, uh, a stand-up uh, locker in there, a full-length full locker to hang their uniforms on and so forth. Uh, and two of them had desks in there, for one for the captain and one for the primary engineer. One thing I thought that was interesting when we were taking the tour was, I guess, um, whoever was preparing the meals, there was a certain thing that they would do to make sure that they didn't break dishes. Oh, um, they, they served the meals uh, on China, which a lot of people don't under, realize, uh, but what they did in bad weather, they would wet a towel and put it down, uh, and that way the ch China would not slide off the table as easily. Uh, and also in the, in the officers' quarters, uh, they have a table there with chairs, and there was a rope that would go around behind the back of the chair so that in bad weather they wouldn't fall over. 
so they tied the rope up. That's amazing, yeah. all the things that you have to think yeah, of. Yeah, just little things, yeah. You know, when you're at sea, but you go into the kitchen, and the kitchen looks like it's a pretty big uh, mess, actually. Galley. Galley, <laughs> excuse me. So it, it seems it's like it's a very pretty spacious, big. It's a very spacious kitchen. Uh, the cooks were graduates of the Coast Guard Cooking School. Uh, usually there were two on board. Uh, and they would rotate. You do hear stories about when the, one of the, both cooks were gone. It was a very troubling time for the men because they assigned somebody that was not a cook yeah. and they ate a lot of bologna sandwiches and, and peanut butter and jelly. Yeah, yeah you so, know, if you don't keep your crew happy, yeah. you got to feed them. You'll notice uh, we have a menu down below that was actually on one of the ships that served here on Overfall Station. Uh, and if you look at it, you'll see that they w ate extremely well. They had a very good, and like like what kinds of things would they eat? Well, they had French toast and pancakes and bacon and eggs and roast beef and uh, soups and uh, you, wow. you just go. They ate well. The Coast Guard service, their per diem per man was higher than the rest of the Coast Guard service because it was considered a little bit like the submarine service. Uh, it was very uh, isolated, and then it was also at times it was very scary. Um, so they, one of the ways they compensated the men was they fed them quite well. I can imagine it was, uh, they all have stories to tell. Thank you very much. You're very well. And we'll be right back. I'm Sam Prestia from Barnhill Preserve and I love all the animals on the 302. Welcome back. We're here with Tracy Mulvaney, and she basically runs the ship. No, I don't, <laughs> but I make sure it runs. There you go. So you've been with the organization for oh, quite a while. Yes, since 2005. So what exactly is the Dirty Hands Gang? Well, the Dirty Hands Gang is a group of volunteers, at the present time all men, and have been, they have worked and been responsible for all the restoration except the actual hull restoration. We had to have that professionally done. Mm -hmm. But they have done all the other restoration work that you see on the ship to bring it from what used to be called a rust bucket in a muddy hole <laughs> to what you see today. So you've seen the changes? Absolutely. It really was a rust bucket when it came here. It, it came here in 1973 and it wasn't it was still it, not in very good shape then because it had sat in a boat yard down in Virginia for two years with nobody doing anything. And then the Navy, the Coast Guard slash Navy, said, we got to get rid of these pieces of junk. And so they started putting out notices that they were either going to be sold for scrap or whatever. And a local historian snagged this one for us. Mm -hmm. And they brought it here. But it was a mess when we got it. And it sat here from the time they brought it here until 1999 with no care, no nothing. Oh, wow. And so it just gradually rusted more and more and more and sunk farther and farther and farther into the mud until at one point it wasn't even upright anymore. It was leaning so uh -oh. far over in the mud that it was so sad looking and the city didn't like it, nobody liked it. And they were gonna sell it again for scrap when a few very dedicated people, one of whom was the president of the organization that owned it, who was very much against actually scrapping it, and another woman that he was close friends with, and they banded together and put an advertisement in the newspaper in July of 1999 and said, if anybody wants to save the ship, meet us on the deck of the ship on this date, and we're gonna try to save it. And 26 people showed up. Wow, that's great. And they all put in 100 bucks, and that's how they started. And the, uh, the c previous owners that we eventually bought it from said, we'll give you a year. And if you can show us that you can do anything with this hunk of junk, we'll sell it to you for a dollar. So that's how we got it. And so in 2000, we formed the Overfalls Foundation and that's where we've been ever since. That's amazing. Now, Ray told your story earlier about the uh, crew on here, you know, learning to speak in 30 in seconds. 30 second first. increments, yeah. Have you talked to a lot of, uh, you know, of the crew members that might have been on this um, light ship or other light ships? I, not a lot of them, but I have talked to a few. One who was most interesting to me because I like, I'm a chef and like to cook. Um, he was a cook and he came on board to because he was looking for his cabin to see if the uh, paintings that he had put on the ceiling 
were still there. But of course, before we got it, the Coast Guard or whoever did it had just painted over everything battleship gray, the whole inside. Was just, so it wasn't there. But I got to talk to him and he was telling me about how when he came on, he, he passed some test and they said, you're going to be a cook. So he was. And he said, but what, there wasn't much else to do when you weren't working. The cooks worked different shifts than everybody else. Mm -hmm. They worked 12-hour shifts from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then they were off. But everybody else was still working in eight-hour shifts, or sometimes four hours, and they would rotate. They called them, not shifts, they called them watches. Okay. And they wrote, in fact, I don't know if they showed you down below, there's a chart of the last watch roster for all of the different men who were serving on the ship at the time it was decommissioned. Yeah, I think I, I saw that. And it, interesting to that one is there's supposed to be 14 names on it, but there were 15 because there was a visiting uh, officer who wasn't able to get off, so they put him on the, the watch roster just to give him something to do sure. so they could get him off the ship. So it's the little stories like that that really right. put, you know, the history behind um, the light ship over exactly. And this guy told me he had never read more than anything he was required to read in high school. He was right out of high school. Most of the guys who served on the ship were. They were all between 18 and about 21. Yeah. And they signed up because they thought it sounds like a great life, two weeks on, one week off, you get great pay, you get good food, la da da da. They had no idea what they were getting into. And this guy told me one of the things about light ship life is it's one of two things, either incredibly boring or incredibly scary. And there's not much good in between. Wow. I can imagine, you know, you think about the guys on the ship in a storm, you know, and what that must be going through their minds. Yeah. And he said he started reading because there was nothing else to do. And he became a reader. And as a result of that, he actually went, got off the ship, went to college, became an engineer, and had a successful career based on the fact that he was forced to start reading books because there was nothing else to do. Wow, that's amazing. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, what uh, the organization is hoping to do. Do you have events coming up or fundraisers? Or we do. All of the above. We also do education programs for children. We had uh, several of them this summer. We started them in 2019, and then we got shut down in COVID. So mm. this is only the second year we've been able to do it. And yeah. we do it once a month for uh, school kids from the ages of six to 14. And it's, they, we, they taught one on navigation. They taught one on um, the semaphore flags that we fly and identifying them and the kids got to do a craft. We did one on navigation where they had to use a compass and do a treasure hunt, that sort of thing. And then we did one on knot tying, but apparently none of the kids wanted to give up the beach to learn how to tie knots. So that one was not well attended, <laughs> but we're gonna fly, try it again. And then we have social things for our members, parties. We call them sundowners, or we used to. Now they've been renamed to um, happy hours at the ship rather than sundowners, because apparently nobody knows what sundowners are. <laughs> that name came from South Africa, and they call their happy hours sundowners. So and there you go. That we brought the name back with us from South Africa and thought it would be something here. We have a Christmas party. We do a big fun. What we have before COVID hit, hit us have a big fundraiser in the early spring, early summer, somewhere in there, middle of May to the middle of June. And that's our major non-membership, non-annual giving uh, fundraising event. Mm -hmm. And we hope to revive that in 2022. We're starting to work on that now. Well, fingers so, crossed you'll be yeah, able to do that, that. We can do that for 2022. Tracy, thank you so much for your time. You're more than welcome. I appreciate Enjoy it. it. Okay. We'll be right back. visit overfalls.org. 
That'll do it for this week's episode. We're going to leave you with the star of the show, the light and the signal flags. Until next time, I'm Jackie Ferris. Tell them you saw it on the 302.